sustainability in the 24th century, hovering on Ganymede, and the physics of rescue operations. Grab a cucumber sandwich and let's do the science of the expanse. This week opened with a small sequence that caught my eye. You see a character shaving in the mirror, and they're shaving with what's called a safety razor. It's not a disposable razor. It's not some kind of modern razor. It's an old-style safety razor. And it occurred to me that must be common in the world because reuse and redu reduction of waste is probably an incredibly important issue in the city of the, of the Expanse. You have to remember this is the 24th century, and they're claiming that there are about 31 billion people on the planet at this time. As compared to about 7.1 billion right now and we already have a lot of stress with reuse and water usage and land usage in the future that would just be incredibly difficult and have to be managed very closely so this character using a safety razor to me is a statement by the showrunners that they are very focused on reducing waste and having reusable items and i thought that was a cute scene later on there's another nod to that same theory you see some characters on a uh, luxury yacht they're being entertained by their guests and one of the high-end items that they try to bring out for them are cucumber sandwiches. Now in today's world, there's sort of a fancy dish that's used at tea time or something like that. But in the future, it would probably be very rare and sort of the height of opulence and wealth to even have cucumbers at all to eat. Cucumbers themselves are nutritionally kind of empty and they take a ton of water just to grow. In the future, if land use is very important, then having these would be a sign of wealth, even though they don't taste very good to me at least. A bit of social science here. You see Bobby Draper, one of my favorite characters, go, go over there and just grab a sandwich and start chowing down. Now, I love this scene. As a younger man, I was a soldier, and I firmly recall that in the field, you would eat anything, especially if it was good. You'd have no compunction about going over there, grabbing that, and chowing it down. And we see Bobby doing just that here with joy on her face. I love the actress and what she's doing here. So that would just be a sign that these things are very rare for people in this world, especially if she's from Mars. They would not have any of these sort of luxury vegetables whatsoever. So I thought that was a great scene and really speaks to how important sustainability would be in the world of the Expanse. And I love to see that on display here with these small scenes in the show. Throughout much of this episode, you see the ship, the Rosinante, sort of hovering above the surface of Ganymede and hunting another character through the episode. Now, what really caught my eye is the way they chose to sort of express how the ship would float. And I'm not quite sure this is accurate or how it would actually look, so I wanted to do some of the numbers. First thing to realize is that the Rosinante is just above Ganymede. It's experiencing the same exact gravity pretty much that the people inside the survival dome that we see are experiencing as well. They're walking around normally. So the Rosinante would be lighter because of the one sixth gravity that is on Ganymede. Yes, that's true. But I wanted to sort of figure out what it would take to keep it aloft. So just doing an estimate of how much it must weigh. We've seen estimates before that the Rosinante is about 77 meters long. That's about the length of a modern Boeing 747-8. And that weighs around 220,000 kilograms. Maybe the Rosinante is made of some special carbon fiber and much, much lighter than that. That's fair enough. The space shuttle is around 50 meters and it weighs somewhere around 75,000 kilograms. So let's just assume it's at that weight. But even at that weight, the one sixth gravity on Ganymede means that it still weighs around 11,000 kilograms. So the engines would have to be putting out some sort of thrust out there at the bottom to keep the ship aloft. I wanted to compare that to what we might expect from modern jet engines just to give sort of a benchmark to what has to be happening here. Knowing that modern jet engines produce about 510 kilonewtons of thrust, I wanted to take the numbers on the Rosinante to figure out what it must be producing. And just our standard physics equation of force equals mass times acceleration, if we were to take a, a estimated mass of about 75,000 kilograms and use the acceleration of gravity on Ganymede, which is about 1.428 meters per second, then we come out about 107 kilonewtons of force required just to keep the Rosinante hovering at a steady altitude above Ganymede. That's about 21% of the thrust of a jet engine at takeoff. So what we would expect to see below the craft are a bunch of debris flying around, dust from the surface. It would be enough certainly to push that stuff around and we don't see it here. I think the main reason why we don't is because the special effects budget to create that kind of particulate matter would be a little bit too high. So I don't fault the show at all. And a matter of fact, their way of displaying it here is pretty good to me. They use enough of a cut and enough of special effects to show you sort of what's going on with the ship, but they don't linger. They know they don't have the budget to do it here. So they're not spending a lot of time on the scene and I actually sort of prefer that. As a depiction of science, I actually think that's pretty good. 
Something that really isn't explainable to me is originally when the ship comes into frame, it's going horizontally across the surface of Ganymede. I'm not quite sure how it stays aloft. There's no aerodynamics to keep it up there. So it'd probably have to either be flipping or be kept aloft by the thrusters, which would be a generous estimate. Thrusters even then are not likely to provide a whole lot of force and certainly not enough to keep it aloft. Maybe there are some sort of side engines. I don't know. The other piece that this implies is the drive cone at the bottom of the Rosinante must be gimbaled in some sort, which means it can rotate and sort of provide some maneuverability for the ship as it's hovering vertically above the surface. We see that on a modern rocket, so that's not much of a leap. We haven't seen any sort of indication that, that that cone is gimbaled, but it's really not that difficult to do. So I think it's a fair guess to say that that cone is gimbaled. What I'd like to hear, though, is your theory on this. What is your theory on how that's staying aloft and how those thrusters on the Rosinante work? Do you think it's gimbaled on the, on the lower cone, or do you think because it's a fusion drive, that's probably out of bounds? Do you think the thrusters are enough to keep it aloft? Or do you think that this scene just sort of broke immersion for you? I'd love to hear what you think about it. So use the hashtag my theory and put your thoughts down in the comments below for everyone to talk about. I'm looking forward to your thoughts and what kind of discussion evolves from that. last bit I wanted to talk about is the sequence involving the rescue of people who are stranded on Ganymede to get them off world and a few facts I've seen discussed around that. The first is the topic of air as it relates to air circulators on board the ship being used to rescue them. I've seen some Reddit conversations where people questioned why they would be using air tanks and if that was very accurate, but I actually think it is. You have to remember the Weeping Sinambulus, that's the ship that they're using to bring them off. That's a cargo ship. It would not be intended to have a very large crew. So yes, it would have air circulation and air filtration, uh, but it would be only geared for 10 people at most or some small crew size. They're talking about bringing 52 people up off of the surface. That would stress it beyond its ability to recirculate and refresh the air, so there would be an upper limit to the number of people they could take off. They probably have some sort of secondary air tank to keep air stored in for emergency scenarios. Again, it's not going to be a whole lot, so limiting the number of people perfectly reasonable to me, and I think was a good call for what, how they have to run ships in the future. The other question I saw is why why are they shutting down the air filtration system on the station at Ganymede itself? They, why not just keep the reactors running and keep those powered? I think assuming that the generators are still running or power is being generated is a bit of an assumption. The station has taken quite a bit of damage from the falling debris that we saw earlier, so it's reasonable to assume that the solar panels or fusion generators or whatever have been knocked out of commission and that they're running off of battery power. If that was the case, it's probably a reasonable assumption to think that some AI or computer controlled or even human system system is systematically shutting the base down as the batteries get drained just to keep certain critical functions alive. So this scene seems pretty reasonable to me. The main discussion I saw this week though was around the evacuation of the ship from the planet and the refugees that are stacked up in it that they seem pretty comfortable as they take off and people were expecting more of a shake to the ship and those people to be under much more force. And actually, I think they're missing the point that, th again, this isn't Earth. So we're shaping our expectations around what we see from rockets and movies about rockets lifting off from here on Earth. It wouldn't be that case in Ganymede. It's one sixth the gravity again, so you wouldn't need as much force to, to lift off. Plus, there's no atmosphere that the ship is going through. So there probably, unless the, the engines were shaking, there probably wouldn't be much shaking of the ship at all. And they could easily lift off with only a G of force, which would be comfortable for these people. Again, though, I wanted to turn to the math to see what actually would need to be going on here. So knowing that Ganymede is about one sixth the gravity of Earth, its escape velocity is only 2.74 kilometers per second, which is very, very low. So whereas applying a G of force on Earth would only let you hover above the planet, applying a G of force on Ganymede would easily take you off of the surface. Knowing that the time to reach that escape velocity is just the velocity over the acceleration, assuming they're starting at zero, using those numbers, we'd know we'd only end up at about 279 seconds to reach escape velocity, only about or only about 4.7 minutes. Easily doable. So even a ship as sort of clunky as the Weeping Sinambulus, that's the name of the ship, that would easily be able to generate the kind of thrust to get that ship off of the surface. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, it would help me a lot if you please click the like button below. If you want to catch future episodes, be sure to click the subscribe button and for notifications, click the bell icon next to subscribe to get a pop up whenever I post a new show each week. If you think your friends might enjoy the show, please click the share button below and tell them about it on Facebook and Twitter. 
As always, I'd love to hear your comments on what you heard today, what you enjoyed, if you felt like we left something out, or if you have something to add. If you've gotten this far, use the hashtag cucumber sandwich, and I know you got all the way to the end. You can also follow me on Twitter at Streamweaver and leave a comment there. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to your theories this week, and as always, stay curious. Stay curious.